and it hits me, oh my gosh, this is that triangle. You know, there's explanation for everything that occurred in the Rendlesham Forest incident that doesn't involve aliens at all. It was completely silent. It comes right over our heads. He saw a classic flying saucer really standing in the clearing. He turned over to my father and held his hand and he looked in his eyes and he said, we're not alone. Welcome to Podcast UFO for our live show. We're live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Please remember to visit the website podcastufo.com for past episodes, blogs, and forums. During the show, feel free to participate live in our chat room. And don't forget to like us on our very active Facebook page. Well, hello and welcome to the Dark Matter Radio Network. I am Martin Willis, the host of Podcast UFO. We're coming at you live. And um, all you listeners that are listening live right now, thanks for joining us at our new time. And you can jump right over to the chat room. That's on our website, podcastufo.com. It's a one-two-click sign-in. And for those of you who aren't listening live, we are starting our live show now at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every Wednesday, of course. And uh, we have Andy Fleming coming up in a minute with a segment called When It Comes to Stars, Size Matters. Well, no comment there, Andy, old chap. Our guest tonight is the one and the only Stanton T. Friedman up in Canada. He'll be joining us in a little while here. Uh, Just a couple of things I want to go over. Um, As I've said in the past, I'm always stealing the news from Peggy, who does our uh, adminning of our Facebook page. And we're getting right up there in numbers. Um, It's a very active site. And we actually had, on this particular story I'm going to talk about, we had 11,000 people uh, joining in somehow, whether they're sharing it, going all over the place on this one story. And that's um, UFO crashes in a Chinese village. And a big, it's not really UFO, but it was unidentified for a while anyway as it was flying through the sky like a big, huge fireball. And it landed in someone's garden. And you got to check the uh, image. It's right on our homepage, podcastufo.com. Uh, it's a really unique-looking thing in this garden. It's kind of like the War of the Worlds when that big round thing landed, you know, the old, the old version. The thing landed in the farmer's field, and it was like a big round thing. So it may open up. Little beings may come out yet. Who knows? Who knows? But anyway... Um, That is in our show notes, the story to that. You can click on that and go right there. Another thing I would like to talk about also on our Facebook page is um, could the mysterious UFOs in the Norwegian Valley be natural? Uh, The name Hesselden um, is familiar with a lot of us because the scientists have actually taken that serious. They have motion-activated cameras that, uh, that have been filming things for a number of years, uh, that goes back to, gee, I think it's like 100 years that there have been sightings in that valley. And uh, now um, some scientists actually took that serious and looked into it, uh, which is a little surprising, but I'm glad that they did. And it looks like it could be a natural phenomena. And same possibly with the Brown Mountain. I'm not really sure. We had a guest on, oh, I don't know, a few weeks ago that was talking about that whole situation. This could be plasma. It could be created like... The valley could be like a natural battery. There's copper uh, deposits on one side, sulfur on the other, and it could create plasma. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever watched any of the videos, so because sometimes those those light balls are doing some pretty strange things. Can plasma do that? I don't know. Can it travel as fast as that and go all in those strange uh, trajectories all over the place? I really don't know. Uh, it's really um, interesting. Check that out also in our show notes. We have uh, links there that will take you right to the original story. So without further ado, I am going to uh, play the astronomy clip with uh, Andy Fleming and hang in there. We'll be back with our guest right after, right after that. And hello, Martin and listeners. Now, we all think that our sun is huge, and it is by earthly standards, but it's just a small yellow dwarf star. Although there are many stars much smaller, such as red dwarfs, there are also many much more massive, and the largest and most luminous star known is V.Y. Canis Majoris, a red hypergiant in the constellation Canis Major. 
At 2,100 solar radii, it is a single star, and if the Earth was a sphere one centimetre in diameter, V.Y. Canis Majoris would have a diameter of two kilometres. Now, a star's size determines its luminosity, colour, temperature and its lifespan. The larger a star, the greater its mass and gravity. High-mass stars with stronger gravity have greater pressure in their cores, creating higher temperatures, and these lead to much faster nuclear fusion reactions, with the release of massive amounts of energy. This creates radiation pressure, and while gravity tries to contract the star, this pressure simultaneously tries to expand it. The result is a stable hydrostatic equilibrium, which can last for billions of years. However, once a star runs out of hydrogen and starts to fuse helium into even heavier elements, this equilibrium ends, and it is no longer a normal main-sequence star. Because high-mass stars burn their fuel much quicker due to the greater core pressure caused by gravity, they live relatively short lives, ending as supernovae. For example, Rigel in Orion is a hot blue supergiant with 17 solar masses. Its massive core pressure means nuclear fusion reactions are racing away and it will run out of fuel within 20 million years. Our Sun, on the other hand, has enough hydrogen to burn for 10 billion years or more. And small red dwarfs, like Proxima Centauri, with lower pressure and lower temperatures, will live much longer than that. An interesting consequence of a star's size and temperature is its brightness, and a larger mass star having a higher temperature will be bluer in colour, while a smaller, cooler star will be redder. So the next time you gaze at brilliant blue-white Rigel, white Sirius, or yellow Arcturus, you're looking at stars in decreasing masses and sizes. So remember, when it comes to stars, size really does matter. Well, okay. Thank you, Andy, as always. All right, everyone, it's time to get in your Snuggies. Isn't that what they call them? They're kind of like a blanket thingy. i got to get me one of those in the wintertime. Pull up your chairs around the old computer and join us in the chat room at Podcast UFO. I'm going to be dialing Stan Friedman the old-fashioned way. And I picture Stan is sitting right next to his pre-Roswell 1947 rotary telephone waiting for it to ring, and here we go. Your call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. <laughs> wow. Isn't that something? It's not available. At the tone, please record your message. Well, he might be on the other line. We'll just try him again. Stan, uh, we were on uh, live. I should, you should be answering your phone. I will, uh, I will try you back. If you wish. This, this, um, this is when I need, like, a whole bunch of you listening to uh, jump onto the chat room and bail me out, start asking some questions. Or uh, let's see. We're going to think of something to do here if I can't get a hold of Stan. We'll give it one more try here. And he was good to go yesterday. So live radio is always interesting. And I'm sorry for you, the live listeners. I can always edit this out. Call has been forwarded to an automatic voice message system. Yeah. Stan Friedman. He's not available at the tone. Um, I'm going to give a phone number. Six, if I can remember it right. Six zero three nine six seven four zero three zero. I'll say that one more time, and I'm ninety nine percent sure that is the right number. If anyone listening live wants to call in, pose a question, or talk about UFOs or a sighting or anything like that, please dial six zero three nine six seven four zero three zero. Ah, someone's calling right now. They're bailing me out. Hello there. This is Martin. Thanks hey. for calling. Hey, Martin. It's John Taggart. Remember, you interviewed me back in the day. Hello. Who's this now? This is John Taggart. You interviewed hey, John. me back in the day. Hey, how are you doing? You were on the show at one time. 
Yeah, I was. Yes. I was actually exciting. I thought I'd kind of fill on a little bit. I was kind of seeing that you had some issues going on, and I wouldn't mind chatting with you again. Yeah. Hey, thanks for thanks for bailing me out here for a few minutes. Now, John, if I remember right, you had a sighting as a real, um, a very young, uh, like out in the playground or something like that. Yeah, I was like eight years old. I remember very vividly. Out in Arizona, it was kind of fascinating. Yeah. I know where the actual is really happening, <laughs> where everything happens. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, if I remember right, you um, uh, you were on the show about a year ago, I think it was, and, and you, it was kind of, it was called Listener Sightings. That's, uh, I had listeners that were involved. Uh, right on. Talk about their sightings. Yeah. And uh, I yeah. remember you said that your mother didn't believe you. Uh, nope. Yeah. Yeah. She didn't, but she did kind of. Well, she I don't know if she does to this day or not. She kinda got of, really religious. She's you know what I mean. Sometimes sometimes religion and UFOs have controversy. <laughs> and sometimes people linking them together too. I mean you Yeah, know, they do. You hear a lot of um people are making reference to the Bible when it comes to UFOs and as a matter of fact I did a little bit of reading in our guest last week and um mm-hmm. he kind of related a lot of that, um of the future doom. Boy, did I get a lot of email from people on that show. Did you happen to listen to that? Uh, was that the last one or the one before? Yeah, it? the last one. Yeah, I did. Yeah. I was right there. I was one of the guests. I didn't realize I could actually just jump on Facebook and you could know who I was. Oh, yeah. I, I had you. I think I was, yeah, I had you chuckling maybe a little bit on some of my comments. Yeah. I know. Hey, I was, I, we have someone on the uh, chat room that's actually asking you a question. Can you believe that? Because I just saw you on the I, chat room. Can you... Uh, can you kind of explain? Your... Teeny teas? Is that what it is? Like yeah. Your... Well, if they skinny want you... Bob. That's right, Skinny Bob. Do you want to just describe your encounter? Sure, sure. Hey, Skinny Bob, how's it going? And, and, and um, let, me, let me just say this. Why don't you take your time? I'm going to be emailing old Stan and see if I can get him after. I can do that. Mm-hmm. I can do that. No problem. Okay. Anyways, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was about 1970, I think. 72. 72, I was like about eight. So I was seven, eight, somewhere in there, giving you my age. I'm not giving my Social Security out, so don't worry about that. <laughs> Anyways, long story long story short, I kind of like uh, was on the playground. I was just playing. And I remember as a little kid watching this show, show Lost in Space. You guys, type something if you watch that. Come on, type something out. Let's see it. You guys ever, ever heard of the show Lost in Space? It might be old school for a lot of people now that I'm a little bit older. Anyways, um, they had this spacecraft on there they utilized for the prop, which really ironically looked exactly like what I saw when I was a little kid. That's what really blew my mind. That's why I remember it so vividly. As a matter of fact, I remember my actual teacher I had in my second grade class, I remember her. I remember she actually made the comment one time in class. She said, uh, "She said today is the first day of the rest of your life." Mm-hmm. And that was the teacher that said that I had a big crush on her as a little, yeah, little kid. <laughs> Everybody has crush on some of their teachers, don't they? Uh, I, I think that's well, see it. <laughs> sort of normal. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Especially it is. Anyway, long story comment. short. Well, I, I did see that, and I tried to call out, as we talked, to classmates, but I just was dumbfounded. I mean, I'm sitting there looking up at it, and it, like, like at least said, you said, did it look the equivalent of a 50-cent 50, you know, 50 piece hanging over your head? It's more like a quarter, so a little higher up. But it definitely looked like the Lost in Space traditional desk right above my head, and then I saw it go from above my head to the other side of the world in a split second, in maybe a couple seconds. I mean, it was like faster than a Lamborghini, Wow! you know, yep. standing beside of it. So that was kind of fascinating. So I think there's something going on. I really do. I think there's something going on. It's fascinating. I don't know if, you know, I'm not sure if the military's involved. I don't know if the government's involved. I don't know. Yep. Well, hey, you know, I was glad. I've been following the I... show. What's that? I've been following the show this whole entire time. Since the way I actually I listened to your third show. That's right. Yeah, you're one of the you're right there from the beginning. 
how the heck did mm -hmm. you even find it? I don't even know how people found it. We have a guy named Scott. He's a real supporter of the show. And he found right. the very first show from the very first show on. And, um, you know, he's always on the Facebook page, and he's a supporter of the show. And while I'm talking about that, right. uh, a few weeks ago I announced, um, you know, asked people to help support our show, keep it um, – keep it commercial free you know we have a donation button and a subscription button on our sidebar and some right. people actually pulled through so i just want to announce a thank you to those people who did that and um i think that's absolutely awesome i think that's very yeah. integral i think it's a major contribution i think anybody who can you know help out should do that yeah you know another way um if if people are looking to help out and they, uh, you know, don't want to spend any, I'm sorry, I just had to send that in email to uh, Stan. Everyone probably heard that. Um, Sorry. But, you know, another way is, um, you know, we're always looking for guest blogs. If someone wants to blog or um, if someone wants to leave us a good review on iTunes or a review on iTunes, whether it's good or bad, that's okay. <laughs> but anyway, um, I just wanted to say thank you. And, well, John, um, I'm going to try to give, now I think I can add Stan on while you're here. I think it's. I think it's Robert Schulinger. Is that his name? Robert Schulinger. He's the one that actually identified the uh, the concept of the graviton. How would oh, they're he, trying to determine if it's reality or not? Yeah, Robert. You know, Robert Schroeder. Schroeder. Yeah. Yeah. He actually made a co comment. He, you guys should go back and listen to that podcast. That's a really good podcast, by the way. Oh. Okay. He made a couple comments yeah. where they're trying to actually determine if the graviton's reality or not. And he said, basically, that Hawking radiation, if you actually come into contact, you see a UFO, and you have a way to actually determine if it's Hawking radiation, that's a viable source of the transportation. That's right. He yeah, was that, very, that was fascinating. very fascinating. I, I've, I've listened to him a few times. Um, I was at a conference where he was at, and as well I as um, that one. interviewing. <laughs> yeah. Hey, listen, um, you know, I just got the news. Stan's, Stan's ready to... Hook up with us. So okay, I'm, I'm backing out. I'm backing out. I'm, I love you. I'll tell you what, you're, you're my favorite podcast in the world. Oh, hey, You man. keep it on, Mark. And I, you know what? I listen to your antique stuff. He's got the antique thing. You guys don't know this, but he's got a little <laughs> antique thing he does on the side. Oh, yeah. I listen to that as well. Is that right? So, wow. Well, yeah. I, I do. I, I love antiques. I love antiques and you. I guess I'm an antique UFO guy. <laughs> <laughs> they go together, at least for me and you. Yeah. All right. So I'll tell you what, Martin, man. You're, you're awesome. I'm going to let you go. I'm listening. I'm hanging out. You guys right. will see me on the tech. I'll be texting. All right. You, you take, take care of yourself. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I love you, bro. Bye. All right. Yeah. Bye bye. All right. We're going to give Stan another call here. It's ringing. Hello. Hello, Stan. How are you? Okay. Well, it's. it's I've, I've did, been here. I don't know why I missed your call, but what the hell? Yeah, it was going right into voicemail. I'm not sure. It, it didn't even ring. It just popped right into voicemail. Now, is this is this a cell phone, Stan? No, it is not. Oh, wow, because I'm hearing a little bit of an don't, echo. Don't own a cell phone. Yeah, I didn't think you did. I'm, yeah. Well, anyway, um, we're here together now, and thanks so much for joining us. And um, I know you just got back from a conference. Is there anything you want to talk about? Well, actually, it was the 15th annual McMinnville UFO Conference, McMinnville, Oregon. Hmm. And it's uh, commemorating <laughs> something that happened in 1950. Two pictures were taken by Paul Trent, a farmer uh, of a UFO, and it has stood the test of time, one of the best UFO pictures ever done, taken. Oh, yes. And uh, the interesting thing is they ran the first uh, conference as the 50th anniversary. And, you know, a one-on, one-up kind of thing, one-off, whatever you call it. And then they thought, well, let's try it again. It was such a success. Well, now they've had 15 in a row. <laughs> and uh, we had a great crowd. Uh, George Nury was there, coast to coast, and me and a few other, Dave Marler, and gave a fine talk about the uh, triangular UFOs, and we had a, a panel discussion that was attended by 700 people. I was impressed. And a wow. great parade. Lots of little kitties along the way. <laughs> wow. Now, isn't this the photo that's, like, taken by a garage or a, a, a barn or something? Well, there's a building off to the side, yes, yeah. with uh, an oil tank or something, and, uh, yeah. 
And that one, yeah, they can't prove, they can't disprove that photo in any way. They've tried for for years. Oh yes, yeah. And the, even the Condon report said uh, all things about it, it would indicate it was genuine. Words to that effect. Uh, one of the few things they said that about. Uh, yeah. And so it is interesting that people will beat a path to a conference. I mean, I'll be in Roswell in July, and uh, another small town. <laughs> Uh, except Roswell is farther away from anywhere, 200 miles from uh, Albuquerque and from El Paso and Amarillo. But they come by the droves. Well over a million people have been there. And, and where? Uh, wow. Where's the nearest airport to Roswell, anyway? Well, Commercial. there is. Uh, there just happens to be a little airport there that was the base for the 509th, the, the atomic bombing group. Yeah. It's got a 13,000-foot runway, man. <laughs> but most people fly into Albuquerque and drive the 200 miles. There's no traffic. Uh, good roads. Yeah, that's right. Um, Do 100 miles an yeah. hour the whole way, really. Well, <laughs> don't I, I don't know if the cops is. would agree with that. But, yeah, uh, yeah it, it's – so Roswell, uh, people come by the droves and – you know, the museum is uh, gets great crowds. And I, I mention this because uh, there's still some people who think, oh, nobody cares about flying saucers. And why well, haven't I heard anything recently about sightings and stuff like that? And, you know, MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, gets over 700 reports a month mm. of, of sightings. So there's plenty going on. And I, when I check my audiences, I've given over 700 lectures. Uh, when I check my audiences after my lecture, typically 10% believe they've seen one. But then I ask, how many of you reported what you saw? Ninety mm-hmm. percent of the hands go down. <laughs> That's right. Yep. Fearful of ridicule. Even though most people believe in flying saucers, most people think most other people don't, so they're afraid to speak up. Well, you know, when until I until had... I come along. <laughs> uh huh. When I had my sighting, I didn't even know that there was a place to report. A UFO, and and I'm a person that's on the internet a lot, and uh, this was back in 2006, and I uh, I never even thought to like search for reporting a UFO. I called the uh, local police station, which and I got a little bit of ridicule from that, um, you know, from them. From but the you've dis- been drinking lately. Huh? Yeah, kind of <laughs> along that line, right? Um, but you know, it's uh, I I don't think um, all the people that do not report them. Um, do it because of their fear of ridicule. I think um, I think a lot of them just don't know that it can be reported. You know, I mean that that's a possibility. Well, that, that's certainly true, and that's why fun. There'll be an annual symposium. Uh, they've had them for forty some years now. Uh, this one will be in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, in middle of July, and I'll be giving a lecture there too on press coverage of UFOs. Oh, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, there's been there've been a couple of at least one PhD thesis about that, but I'll be talking about the failure of the press to do its job and this surprises many people to realize that three of the top uh, science fiction writers, uh, Isaac Asimov, Ben Bova, Arthur Clarke, were strongly and ridiculously anti-UFO. Didn't know anything, but they were sure there was nothing there. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't understand that, but um <laughs> I will be pointing out the difficulties with what they wrote. Um, I'm a strong believer, uh, as a nuclear physicist, to have facts in hand before putting mouth in gear. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't want somebody to take my head off because I made a mistake. Can't have that. <laughs> and uh, that's, uh, you know, I've done radio debates. I've done other debates, even at Oxford University Debating Society. And one. <laughs> I, I love that. And, yeah, I... I'm really interested in, in good debates. So we have a, a message board running, and, you know, some people throwing questions up now and then. Sure. And uh, someone asked a question. I already know the answer to it, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, have you ever seen a UFO yourself? No, I never have. But then I spent 14 years chasing neutrons and gamma rays. Never saw one. Yeah. That's They're a, real, too. <laughs> that's a good a good answer. And, you know, speaking of that, you know, uh, it always makes me wonder, and I've said this probably too many times, but how much money and research is into things such as dark matter and particle science. Uh, so many billions are spent on that when 
you know, what what is spent on uh, what people are seeing flying around in the skies? Really? Well, the not problem too much. is we don't know. Uh, the best sensors for making sense out of what's uh, going around in the skies belong to the government. Radar, satellites, mm -hmm. uh, airplanes chasing UFOs with gun cameras, all that sort of stuff. And we've got a cosmic water gate. Uh, I like the phrase, so I use it. Uh, where the government, well, uh, to give you an example, now everybody has heard of the NSA. It used to be, oh, that's just no such agency, or it never says anything. Well, it's the National Security Agency. And they were willing, because of a lawsuit under Freedom of Information, they released 156 top-secret Umbra UFO documents. Wow! The only trouble was that you could read one sentence per page. Everything else right. was whited out. Mm -hmm. They didn't like my showing blacked-out CIA documents on television, so they used white out. Now, the CIA top-secret Umbra documents are blacked out. Uh, except for maybe, you know, six words on a page, that sort of thing. And, you know, I get people telling me, there's no cover-up. Uh, Dr. Tyson, who will be on the Cosmo show on Sunday night, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, head of the planetarium, uh, the Hayden Planetarium in New York, he said, the proof that the government can't keep secrets is how much we know about President Clinton's genitalia. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Pretty stupid thing to say, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Seth Shostak of the SETI community, you know what SETI stands for, Silly Effort to Investigate, uh, SETI. Mm -hmm. uh, he says the proof we can't, the government can't keep secrets is what a bad job FEMA did on Katrina, the hurricane, and how badly the post office is run. Now, neither <laughs> one of these guys are talking about the CIA, NSA, DIA, NRO, you know, all the alphabets, OSI. ONI, uh, isn't it ridiculous? Uh, Washington Post had an article oh, a couple months ago now. The total black budget for military intelligence this year is approximately $52 billion. Hmm. Uh, the three top being NSA, CIA, and NRO, National Reconnaissance Office. And these guys are saying government can't keep secrets uh mm -hmm. you know, they're living in a dream world right right hey uh stan another uh question sure. do you have any thoughts that on what might be the met the best modern tech to observe ufos in the sky well it would be nice if you had uh, airplanes with uh, magnetic field sensors spectrum analysis, all that sort of stuff, and I presume we've done it. Uh, but they ain't telling us what they found out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the problem. Look, I've been to 20 archives, uh, some of them many times, like the Eisenhower Library, the Truman Library, Library of Congress Manuscript Division, all, all that sort of place. And I love them if somebody pay me to spend my time there. Mm -hmm. But uh, so there's loads of stuff that you can't gain access to. Uh, on the other hand, you find some goodies. Um, one of my books is Top Secret Magic, M-A-J-I-C, uh, about the infamous Majestic 12 documents. And one of the lone voices uh, saying that there are three documents that are uh, real and the most important classified documents ever leaked to the public. And this is a story of briefing for a president like Eisenhower. 1952, uh, a letter, uh, it included a copy of a letter from President Truman in 1947 establishing Majestic 12 and naming the 12 members of this group accountable only to the president and because of the Roswell incident and uh, keeping track of all the other stuff. And I get people saying, oh, those documents aren't real. Here's a bunch of phony ones. Well, there are a bunch of phony ones. So what? There are many isotopes that aren't fissionable. When I want to build a nuclear reactor, uh, you use the one that is. What do I care about the ones that aren't? If you're sick, you want the chemicals that will make you well. You don't say, well, most chemicals will kill you. They won't make you well. That's true but irrelevant, just like the basketball coach has a good sense to say, look, I know most people aren't seven feet tall, and there are a lot more midgets than seven-footers. Oh, no, I need just one. Give me the seven-footer. You can keep the midgets. You know, so, yes, there are a lot of cases that can be explained. 
Who cares? And there are phony documents. Wouldn't you expect the government to put out phony documents if good ones escape from the from the net, so to speak? <laughs> that would be a good, yeah. That would, well, yeah. you know, disinformation is a way of life for governments. Uh, and I don't say that saying it's all bad. Uh, World War II was very important to the United States. That disinformation went out there, went out there that convinced Hitler that the invasion of Europe would take place over near Calais instead of Normandy. And when the general said, hey, they're invading, send us the reserves, he said, no, 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 they're coming in over here, just wait a while. And they waited, and we got our foothold at Normandy. So disinformation is, is a standard technique, and, uh, you know, a few lies here and there. As a matter of fact, when the first atom bomb was tested at Trinity site in New Mexico in uh, August 1945, uh, it was seen from 100 miles away. It was a very successful test, and the skies are pretty clear in New Mexico. And a story finally appeared in the paper. The people were calling the sheriffs, you know, what happened? And a story appeared saying that an ammunition dump had blown up, and fortunately nobody was injured. That was the first atomic bomb. <laughs> and mm. people didn't get the truth until after Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, you know, we mm. tested one right down the road there. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Stan, last summer you and I were at a conference, at the same conference, and um, you and I had a conversation, and I, I found it very interesting. And, and I'd like to rehash that a little bit. And, and what that was about, if you recall, was um, um, the, the, the general thought out there is that people, say, in your stature, um, who I could consider – Probably you're probably the most filmed, uh, lectured um, you know, person in the field, really. The big mouth. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, people have this misconception that um, people do it for money, and that you're you're fil- <laughs> filthy rich from it. Yeah, I, I knew that'd get a laugh. That, out that's of you. pretty funny. Uh, yeah, I had a guy call me once. He said, "I almost didn't call you. I figured you're just in it for the money." I say, "Why do you say that?" Well, I see you on television all the time. I don't get paid. What do you mean you don't get paid? Of course you get paid. I don't get paid. When I saw you on Larry King, I've been on four times. As a, he pays for the air transport and the hotel. He doesn't even cover meals. Uh, well, you show your books uh, as appropriate in the discussion. After all, look at the money he's raking in by having me as a guest. Advertising yeah. brings in a lot of money to television shows. Well, he shut up some then, but... Uh, I, well, how much are you paying me for this interview? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. can't get rich that way. No, it, it, it's crazy. Uh, Carl Sagan's fees were a lot higher than mine, lecture fees. Yes, I do get paid for speaking. Mm-hmm. And everybody who speaks at colleges gets paid. Some a lot more than I do, I'll tell you that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so in it for the money, never. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, think it, I think people that would that would go into it, for the money wouldn't wouldn't be lasting too long, and uh, there's I don't been think ex- so. a few examples of that um, that I know about quietly um, through through a, a former guest has told me uh, of a situation where someone was getting into it primarily, you know, from an old past situation, trying to get back into the limelight, so to speak, because they thought they could uh, become rich out of it, and uh, <laughs> I, that person is fading away right now, so. Good good luck is all I can say. And, you know, there are basic rules if you're going to lecture. Uh, one, have facts in hand before putting mouth in gear. And two, never lie. And we've already excluded a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty funny. Hey, hey, Stan, you chose this path. Uh, you know, I, I remember the story you told about, you know, uh, buying two books and one of them happened to be a UFO book because you were saving on your shipping and all that stuff. But... Um, if you hadn't, well, that's not- how I got interested and initially involved. But I certainly didn't set on the path of becoming a professional ufologist. As a matter of fact, the story is: people say, "Well, how did you switch from being a nuclear physicist working for companies like GE and GM and Westinghouse and McDonnell Douglas and all that sort of stuff?" I said, uh, "I didn't decide to do that. I thought I was go- traveling west from Pittsburgh, where." We had a very successful nuclear rocket test, and they canceled the program. Uh, And I got a job, I thought, at McDonnell Douglas in California. 
the best job I could imagine trying to figure out how flying saucers worked. They had the manned orbiting laboratory program, the mole program, and they could spend a couple percent on what was called blue sky stuff. You know, pretty far out, but maybe the benefit would be pretty far out, too. Anyway, I got the job, Santa Monica, California, and uh, I'm driving across the country to take up my new position. And I hear on the radio that the mole program had been canceled. Oh. I walk in a couple of days later, uh, send, give the gal my, uh, my offer letter, you know, and she says, you know, we just laid off 5,000 people. <laughs> Uh, and I said, yeah, I, I know. Well, they kept me for three months, which was nice of them. I mean, I had an offer letter. They, they couldn't just say, go home. <laughs> but uh, I realized that uh, I got a family to take care of, hmm. you know, mortgage, house, kids, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. I'd better get on the stick. So I started making calls from 6 to 8 in the morning because it was cheaper from the West Coast then to colleges back east and elsewhere. And I managed to make a living, not because I didn't want to work in industry, but because I had responsibilities, and I found I was a good salesman. Uh, and uh, let's face it, I, I won't kid anybody. I love being on the stage. It's suited to my personality. I'm a Leo. <laughs> in the spotlight. Well, Peter Jennings, Benito Mussolini, and me are all born on July 29th. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Uh, I'll be 80 this year in July 20. I thought you were going to be wow, and you're still yeah. you're still going going strong. Do you yeah. have do you have any regrets in the path you took? Uh, not really. Uh, no, because I found, somewhat to my surprise, that I was really suited to what I was doing. I've got a cast iron stomach and a cast iron throat, so I can eat campus food and stuff <laughs> like that. And I can put up with the traveling. People say, isn't it wonderful you get to travel? Travel isn't fun anymore. Yeah. Too much, you know, uh, the security and all that sort of stuff. Look, I just got back from um, McMinnville, Oregon. Three flights each way to mm -hmm. Fredericton, New Brunswick. I was in Pittsburgh, which is a heck of a lot closer. Three flights each way. It's not fun. I mean, I get my exercise walking on the airport. Uh. <laughs> I know I was you know, just uh, just offered to go out to Chicago um, this coming weekend, just a couple of days ago, and it's just no. I, I actually turned it down, and I agree. It's not. It, it doesn't seem so exciting as it used to be. With um, the seats you know, are less comfortable and, and smaller. they're packed. They're they're always packed. You know, so it, the world has changed, and so you don't do this because you like traveling. At least I don't. Uh, last fall. I was in Brazil. It was uh, 85 degrees. And the next week I was in Finland where it was snowing. Wow. And I was helping them celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Finnish UFO Society. Uh, I'd been to Finland before, and it was fun. But uh, And, sure, I've gotten to see places I would never have gotten to see, you know. And I enjoy that. But most of the time you don't get a chance to see anything except at the trip to Brazil. There's one of the world's greatest waterfalls there, not far from the town where we were. Hmm. And a bunch of us had time to go out there and look at the falls. And somebody published it on YouTube. He was taking pictures and set it to music and stuff. So, you know, I, I will admit, I did do some sightseeing then. But most of the time, you're just going full tilt. Interviews, lectures, and travels. And... You know, if I lived someplace where you could go directly to anywhere, that would make it a little easier. I live in Fredericton, New Brunswick, and you can fly to a long list of cities, Toronto, Montreal, Ottawa, and Halifax, period, end of report. you got to make a connection. <laughs> wow. Wow. Hey, we got a, we got a, a bunch of uh, questions up on that. Sure. And they just keep rolling in. But the last question I'm going to ask you, and then I'll get to these, is um, – You've been at this for a very long time. Do First lecture in 1967. Wow. Yeah. Uh, do you think that we're any closer now to knowing something? Well, yeah, I think we know a great deal. Uh, I'm not saying the government is any closer to telling us what it knows. But we've managed to, to learn uh, quite a lot. And one important thing that's changed, it's the attitude of the public 
it used to be thought that there's only one solar system, ours. Earth's the only planet with life on it. And boy, we're at the top of the heap. Aren't we special? Now, thanks to the Kepler satellite, which is a marvelous device, uh, now we know that in our own galaxy, Milky Way, maybe 200 billion stars, there's probably 10 billion places that could be sending us signals that could be that have life and civilizations and so forth. And suddenly we're learning that we're not the big shots we'd like to think we are. And one of the things about that that's particularly intriguing is that people have trying to forget how long things have been around. I mean, yeah, Pat Robertson says everything was created in 4004 B.C. on a Thursday afternoon, I think it was. Uh, I think he left six zeros out of that. And suddenly our history becomes very, very short. Other people could have sent their Keplers out a billion years ago. That's right. You know, and just look look at a simple thing, like how long does it take to go around the planet? Well, Magellan did it in three years. Wow. The space station does it in 90 minutes. <laughs> That's right, right. Hey, we Technological have... Technological progress comes from doing things differently in an unpredictable way. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's good. Hey, we have uh, one of the people, uh, a strong supporter of the show for the very since the very beginning of the podcast, Scott's uh, little son. He was just putting to bed, and uh, his little boy named Lucas wanted to know um, if a... how similar you would think an alien would be to a human being? Well, it's not a question of what I would think. The evidence tells us that many of the aliens that come here, I mean, they send the ammonia breathers to Jupiter, you know, uh, are humanoid in the sense of two arms, two legs, a head, and a body, usually. In the Betty and Barney Hill case, uh, my book captured the Betty and Barney Hill UFO experience. The aliens were short guys, uh, I think they were guys, no hair, but humanoid, you know, bigger eyes than we have, stuff like that. No cross between a giraffe and an octopus or anything like that. That doesn't mean there aren't weird critters out there, only they don't seem the ones to be coming here. So uh, the evidence, the reports from all over the world... Uh, indicate that uh, most aliens on board the craft are humanoid. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They might tell they weren't from here, except maybe if you're in New York, you might think, well, there are all kinds of strange people there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I watched a documentary one time that was kind of saying, I'm trying to remember the name of it, but it was basically saying that they wouldn't be anything like us because of the way you know, evolution happened here and whatever, and they'd probably, you know, I mean, I don't know where these, this particular documentary was getting all this, but it was saying, why would they have just one eye? They'd probably have, you know, a hundred eyes. I mean, two eyes where they'd have a hundred eyes, well, you know, on and on. There and on. are people who've made a good case for, you need two ears and two eyes. You get binocular vision and hearing so you can locate where the sound is coming from. The head has to be at the top of the body so you can be aware of your enemies approaching you. You need some means of manipulating the environment. Hands are fine for that. You need to escape from your enemies, so you need legs. You, need, you can't just crawl like a turtle or you don't last very long. <laughs> but the point is, why hypothesize? We see what we see. And also, uh, look, my grandparents all come from Europe. Uh, who's to say this isn't a colony that we haven't been colonized many times over? Uh, how did people wind up in the new world? Colonization, migration, crash landing. Uh, the notion that, uh, you know, it's either by accident or uh, all kinds of beings. And, and let me deal with an important question here. Is, why would anybody come here, Stan, I'm asked. Uh, is it, it, there's nothing special about us. Well, there is. Mm -hmm. Two obvious things when you think about it. One is we have joined the club of the advanced civilizations who know that the most important source of energy in the universe is nuclear fusion. That's what goes on in all the stars, including mm -hmm. the sun. Now, as early as 1962, I was working on a study of fusion propulsion for deep space travel. We, knowing about fusion, if we wanted to spend the money, could go to the stars. 
nearby stars. I'm not talking other galaxies or across our own. I mean, if my wife needs a loaf of bread for dinner, I don't say, honey, I'll be back next week. There's a great bakery in Sydney, Australia. She'd say, the superstore is a mile and a half away, and we need it for dinner, Stan. Uh, you know, so there are well over a 1,000 stars within a mere 54 light years of here. But one of the reasons, not just getting a loaf of bread, but I think one of the reasons we're coming here is to quarantine us. I figure every society that we know about it is concerned about its own survival and security, don't you think? I mean, if they're not, they won't survive. That means you've got to keep tabs on the primitives in the neighborhood, but only close tabs on those primitives who show signs of being able to bother you. By the end of World War II, it was perfectly obvious that these earthlings, who are clearly a primitive society, and I don't know whether the kids learned this in school or not, but we killed 50 million of our own kind. Mm. We destroyed 1,700 cities. Nobody could say we're nice guys, and we're spending a trillion dollars this year on things military. Well, there are kids starving, right. literally, uh, lots of them. So anybody coming here would want to make sure we didn't go out there. Uh, and I can't blame them. Mm. Uh and one, one of the problems is that the, the academics seem to think that all research and development goes on at universities. That's nonsense. The atom bomb wasn't designed at a university, the first nuclear chain reaction, but putting it into practice uh, was done in, by a national lab, uh, several national labs, actually. Yeah, and how many uh, people were involved in that? Because it goes back to the, the uh, theory that they were saying that governments can't keep secrets. Well... There are how many thousands of people were involved? People say in up to 60,000 at one time or another. Mm -hmm. And the budget was uh, several billion dollars, which, considering we're talking the 40s. Well, let me give you one example. The, uh, one of the key ingredients in the bomb is enriched uranium. U-235 is only present in seven-tenths of one percent of all those uranium atoms. Got to find a way to get it up to around 90 for a bomb. What did we do? We built a gaseous diffusion plant in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, in the middle of nowhere. It was over a mile long, and while in operation, pumping uh, uranium gas through tiny little holes and uh, special metal sheets of nickel, uh, we used 5% of all the electricity being produced in the United States to oh. do that. Jeez. When I worked on nuclear airplanes, 1958, General Electric Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion Department, just outside Cincinnati, in 1958, we spent $100 million. We employed 3,500 people full-time, of whom 1,100 were engineers and scientists. Now, $100 million was a lot of money in 1958. And this, uh, our results were classified. Nobody knew what we were doing. Right. So big programs are done. Well, a stealth aircraft was built at a cost of $10 billion in secret over a period of 10 years by Lockheed. Not some university. I've had, you know, I'm the original civilian investigator of the Roswell incident. And I've had people say, Stan, if Roswell really happened, they would have to have taken half the physicists out of colleges to deal with that. And I laughed. I said, you've got to be kidding <laughs> Are you really not aware of the thousands of people with great talent and high-level security clearances? Los Alamos, Sandia, Livermore, Oak Ridge, a, it's a bunch of these places. Mm -hmm. and, and I've had other people say, oh, if that had happened, there would have been an article in the Physical Review, which is a big magazine of the American Physical Society, within two months. I think you're crazy. That's not how these things work. Mm -hmm. Secrecy is real, and despite people, uh, Dr. Tyson and Dr. Shostak, secrets are being kept all the time. I've had people say, oh, Stan, those guys with Majestic 12, secret group to deal with crash flying saucers, etc., they surely would have told their wives. I said, you've got to be kidding. I never told my wife anything classified. 
and break the rules, and it's at a risk. I can't control what she says inadvertently someplace else. I never told her anything classified. So there's also another uh, common gap is people say, oh, everything's declassified after 20 years, Stan. Mm-hmm. That's simply not true. And when you go to the archives, you find that out. Uh, you, you get the files, and there are replacement sheets. Uh, you can make uh, an automatic classification review if you want, request to have something declassified. It might take you two years. Uh, that doesn't mean it's going to be declassified. Uh-huh. And I, I got some interesting stuff because I picked up on some things, and they're, they're discussed in Top Secret Magic for that matter. But uh, the notion that uh, can't keep secrets and it's all easy to get, and part of it is the egos of the people in Washington, generals and politicians. Mm-hmm. If this were happening, I'm so important, I would have known about it. <laughs> right, right. Now, you have actually had waited up to a few years for some of these documents to come through? Yep, two years in one case, a very important document, which... Now, do they follow up with you what's going on with that, or you just have to sit and wait? You sit and wait. You fill out the sheets. The library, in that case, the Eisenhower Library, uh, submitted it to the appropriate agency. And sometimes what happens, say they submit it to the National Security Council, they might say, oh, we better run this past the CIA. So it goes to the bottom of the pile at the CIA. Mm -hmm. And I've been turned Start all over again, huh? Yeah. Yeah, so people think, oh, it's easy. It isn't easy, and you got to be persistent. And, well, uh, some people don't seem to want to do their homework. Uh, one of the majestic 12 people, most of the names made sense, but there was one that didn't, Dr. Donald Howard Menzel, a Harvard University professor of astronomy. Everybody else we know had high-level security clearances, I mean, three of them were directors of central intelligence, you know, chief of staff of the Air Force, people like that. We know they had high-level security clearance. But you don't need a security clearance to teach astronomy at Harvard. And he had written three anti-UFO books. He was a debunker. Mm. How could he be part of somebody, a group that knew about crash saucers and et cetera, et cetera? Well, we didn't want to go public with this until we did our homework. Uh all the members of MJ-12 were dead, which made it convenient, you might say. I checked with Harvard. I ran across an article that implied that he had a clearance. So I checked with Harvard. They had his papers. I had to get approval from three different people to see his papers and discovered to my total shock, because I didn't like him when he was alive, uh, that he told Jack Kennedy who had been head of the Board of Overseers at Harvard, and so Menzel's area, that's how they got to know each other. He told Jack that there's one area where I may be able to help you. I've had a longer continuous association with the National Security Agency, Mr. Snowden's agency, you know, Mm -hmm. Uh, more than 30 years at that time. And when we are properly cleared to each other, I can tell you more. This is what he says Mm -hmm. to the president. Uh, and I still got people saying, oh, he couldn't have led a double life. Well, I'm sorry. Go there and look at the documents, the letters. I quote from uh, extensively from the material in my book. doesn't matter. They know it can't be. And I will give three names for people who are interested in such things. Burgess, Philby, and McLean. They were three Russian spies who worked in British intelligence for many years. You got to lead a double life under those conditions. You got to be very careful what you say because you don't want to leak information that will let people know where the leak came from, that sort of thing. So I get a little irked at the people, the, the nasty, noisy negativists, as I call them, who won't do their homework but insist there can be nothing to it. Well, uh, one of the people I'll be talking about in my paper at the MUFON convention in Cherry Hill in July. And I should say, all my dates are all on my website, www.stantfriedman.com. One of the people I'll be talking about is a guy named Philip Klass. Mm-hmm. Worked in Washington, senior avionics editor for Aviation Week and Space Technology. The go-to guy for a disbeliever. And he complained that one of the documents, perhaps I hadn't noticed. I'm saying it's genuine, but... 
maybe you didn't notice that it was done in the large pica type. But I've got nine NSC, National Security Council documents, that's where this one was from, done in the small elite type. And I will pay you $100 for each and every document, up to a maximum of 10, done in the same size and style type as that one, that pica type one that you say is genuine. Ha! Huh. He gave me 60 days. Well, I was going to the Eisenhower Library uh, within two weeks, and I went and dug out 14 documents that met all his criteria. He sent him copies and sent him an invoice for $1,000 because he set a limit of 10, unfortunately. I could have used more money than that, but what the heck. <laughs> Get what you can when you can. Right. And right. he paid me. And then he got very angry when I printed a copy of his check. <laughs> <laughs> it's something I wrote threatened to sue me. I told them, look, you sent me a check. I Xeroxed it. I took the check to the bank. They cashed it. I can do whatever I darn please with the Xerox. So, and he shut up. So I'm going to be looking at his papers soon. And I'm told there is no Stanton Friedman file there, even though we corresponded for 20 years. Wow. Hey, Stan, you know, is- we are totally plumb out of time. I'm getting... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, no, no. I wish we could talk for another two hours, but I have to run to the end of the show. I have to run the show uh, end real quickly here. So thanks so much, and we're going to have you back again, of course. You're what I consider okay. a regular guest. Good. All right. www.stantonfriedman.com. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so that's it for the show today. If you missed any part of it, you can catch the uh, other podcasts on our website. You can also check out links to the show notes. Uh, Alejandro Rojas will be on next week. I want to thank everyone for helping out. I'm trying to make this short. And uh, you can check us out live next week on the Dark Matter Radio Network right here at 9 p.m. And uh, we'll see you next week. And thanks for your patience with all the mess-ups with uh, the phone not working today. Talk to you next week, everyone.